Hi guys, hope you're feeling happy today. I was gonna let that keep playing, but we have a long lesson today and um, we need to get working. So let me click over here. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed writing your story and you finished that. Um, today, you're going to be writing a scene using dialogue, a scene between two characters and um, a problem, maybe a discussion that they're having. Um, so you'll need a pencil or whatever you want to use to write with and um, your spiral or your a piece of paper probably a clean piece since you're gonna start a new task and I'm gonna scoop my lesson book over here before we start reading and explain to you what I want you to do because I get into my work and then I forget to give you the assignment so um, you're gonna write a scene of dialogue now, um, you're going to write a narrative. So remember a story, it's a story about real or imagined events. So this can be based on something that's really happened to you if you'd like. Um, narratives can be told by the character in the story or your outside narrator. So when you write this one assignment today, you can use first person I or you can use third person he, she, they, them, your choice. Um, you need to establish a situation or a problem and introduce the characters so that we get a good feel of your characters. Um, today, I want you to write, and again, this will be when we're finished reading chapters seven and eight, so hunker down. It's going to be a big lesson today. You're going to write a scene, so just a scene. It doesn't have to be an entire situation from beginning to end, just a part, okay, um, of dialogue using, using quotation marks between two or more characters who work together to come up with creative solutions to a problem, okay? So, two or more characters, it's easiest if you just keep it to two. There's a problem that they have and they need to come up with solutions. So think about an event or a problem that you want to write about. Then think about who's going to tell the story, if it's going to be you, I, or third person. And then how are you going to use dialogue to explain the events and the conversation between the characters? The whole thing isn't going to be in dialogue, just parts of it. Okay, you'll have normal sentences in there also. I'm not going to say how long it has to be. Again, you can Google share it with me or just keep track of it and bring it in when we get back together again. Um, so for those of you who forget and are going, now what's dialogue? I don't remember her talking about dialogue. Hmm, some of you. Students, um, you, I need you to understand that when characters are speaking, their words are enclosed, closed with quotation marks. You call them bunny ears when you're little people, remember? This tells the character what they're saying, the words out loud that they would be saying. So you're not going to put quotation marks, Bob said. Don't put that in quotation marks. Bob said, comma, I like the rain. Whatever. Okay. So that's your assignment when we're done reading. And as we read, if Greg and Maura are going to have situations going on, it might give you some ideas of a situation you might want to write about. Um, okay. Let's get started, and I've got a few things. I'll, I'll be stopping you as we go, but don't start the writing assignment yet. We're going to read first. Chapter 7 is called Order and Chaos. Now, would order and chaos be synonyms or antonyms? Remember, synonym means the same. Antonym is opposite. So order and chaos would be an antonym. Okay. Ashworth Intermediate School was a big outfit, and when you put 450 kids, mostly between the ages of 9 and 12, under one roof, a certain amount of hubbub and clutter is normal, and therefore room 27 was not normal. Room 27 at Ashworth School was never messy, never loud. Room 27 was always like a peaceful island. Ooh, they're comparing room 27 to a peaceful island, and they're using the word like. What figurative language is that? Nailed it. Simile. That's because the small kingdom known as Room 27 was controlled by Mr. Anthony Xenotopoulos, who, for obvious reasons, was known simply as Mr. Z. Mr. Z was a man of average size, except perhaps for his head, which seemed a bit too large for his body. That's a good visual. But that might have been an optical illusion, because by the burst of black and gray hair spiraling out one or two inches in all directions, Apart from his unruly turn-your-page hair, Mr. Z dressed neatly, and there's a picture 
in case you can't get a visual in your head. I could. Mine looked a little bit crazier than that guy, but, but not formally. He wore a coat and a tie only for the end of the year assembly. The rest of the time he wore khakis, and khakis are like brown dress pants or corduroys. And those, some of you have corduroys, they're the pants with kind of like the little lines and they swish when you walk. And loose fitting collared shirts, carefully ironed. He had piercing dark eyes and a bright smile, which made him harder, which made it harder to notice the large nose that lived between them. Mr. Z taught sixth graders, and in his kingdom, mathematics ruled. Some of you are going to like this, but my math buffs out there. Everything about his room, including his legendary calmness, was a function of math. Mr. Z did not just teach sixth grade math, he lived math. He breathed and ate and slept and dreamed math. His wife taught geometry at the high school, so you could even say that he had married math. Plus, their only son was an engineering major at the state university. For Mr. Z, math was the source of all that was beautiful, good, and true. Math controlled the orbits of the planet, always in perfect stressless balance. Math was frictionless. Math supplied the principles that sent rockets past the moon and helped Beethoven create his symphonies. Mr. Z believed that even the smile of the Mona Lisa, that's a famous painting you can Google if you'd like, like the spiral of the chambered nautilus could be expressed as a ratio, a set of elegant numbers. So if you want to look up the spiral of the chambered nautilus, chambered, C-H-A-M-B-E-R-E-D, nautilus, can you see it? Um, if you look that up, you'll see it's a, um, I looked it up because I couldn't remember what the um, ratio was. So the chambered nautilus is often used as an example of the golden spiral. While nautiluses show logarithmic, logarithmic spirals, the ratios range from 1.24 to 1.43, with an average ratio of about 1.33 to 1. The golden spirals ratio was 1.618, and it looks like a shell. So if you're interested, go ahead and Google that. I would show you the picture on my screen, but I'm afraid if I move my recording, I'm going to screw it up. So I don't want to mess it up. Um, the alarm clock, the thermometer, the calendar, the digital watch on his wrist, the odometer in his car, the test and quiz scores of his students, the percentage points of his graduating scale, they gave him the numbers he lived by. He woke each day at 6.15, school or no school. Channel 7's weather forecasts were the most accurate. He'd done a three-year study himself, so he predicted high temperature of 70 degrees or warmer equals khaki pants. Sorry, I'm turning my page so I'm organized. Equals khaki pants plus a short sleeve shirt. 69 degrees or below equals corduroys plus long sleeves. And for a high temperature of 40 degrees or lower plus one sweater. Do you see how they did that in that sentence? They organized it like a, a math problem equation. Interesting. Turn to page 60. Mr. B Z put his heavy downed coat into storage on March 1st and got it out again on October 1st. He had an appointment at the barbershop every third Tuesday at 4.15. He changed the oil in his white Toyota Camry every 5,500 miles, and when the odometer reached 110,000 miles, the 12th oil change, he and his wife began shopping for a new white Camry. Why a Camry? Math. The Camry was a car that cost the least amount of dollars and had the most features he could afford and had the fewest service problems. Why white? Again, math. White was the color that kept the inside temperature of the car the lowest in the summer. When running the air conditioner meant buying more gas and getting fewer miles per gallon. There were 185 school days per year and 55 minutes in each class period. Mr. Z wrote the number of remaining minutes of math class on the board at the start of each day, beginning at 10,175. Quiz scores counted once and test scores counted twice. Grade percentages were calculated out to three decimal places, then rounded up. And arguing about grades was pointless. Numbers never lied. Mr. Z had a sense of humor, but it was a mathematical sense of humor. He wasn't witty or clever, but he had an almost endless supply of math puns. What did the triangle say to the circle? Your life seems so pointless. Hmm, Sean, you're going to like that one. What did the 90-degree angle say to the 91-degree angle? Don't be obtuse. What did the plus sign say to the minus sign? You're always so negative. Why didn't the recti rectilinear equilateral <laughs> like jazz? He was a square, and so was Mr. Z. So if Mr. Z seemed stiff or set in his ways or rigid in his views, that was a function of math as well. In math, there are fixed rules. Math involved pure operations that required no bending, no guesswork, no emotional adjustments, only the glide and flow of intelligence. There were always answers, right answers, and it was possible to understand exactly what was right about them. And that's why Mr. Z loved math. 
loved, not liked, not enjoyed, not, not appreciated, loved. He loved thinking about math. He loved using it, and most of all, he loved teaching it. Math was perfect. Math clarified the jumbled minds and disciplined the untidy lives of his students. So many things changed constantly. Politics, turn top at page 62, weather, the price of energy, the cover of Time magazine, not math. As he told his students, now and forever, two plus two will always equal four, every single day. But on this particular day, with 9,790 minutes of class remaining in his sixth grade year, Greg Kenton came stomping into the orderly world of room 27 with a head full of chaos. He walked straight over to Mara Shaw. He slapped the incy weensy book down onto her desk, and through clenched teeth he said, Nice, nice ripoff. You're such a thief. You stole my idea, and you know it, so stop it. Stop it now. Moore jumped up, nose to nose with Greg. Oh, sure, like you invented paper and drawings, and words, too, right? Just so you know, anybody can make anything they want to, and they can sell stuff, too. It's a free country, like for over 200 years, or hadn't you heard? So notice the dialogue here, because you're going to be doing this. Mr. Z looked up from his gradebook, saw the disturbance, okay, What's a synonym for disturbance? A word that means the same. It was in the title of the chapter. It started with a C. Chaos, that's what I was thinking. In aisle four and got to his feet. Speaking as he moved, he was at the scene in three seconds. All right, all right there. Easy does it. Greg, lower your voice. Maura, you too. And sit down. Now, what's this about? Simple. Greg opened the pencil case and said, I started making these great little comic books, and now she's ripping me off with her stupid imitation. She's using my idea, and it's like she's stealing money right out of my pocket. He pointed at the unicorn book on her desk. That's what this is about? Maura shook her head. What it's about is that you're a greedy little money grubber, just like always. Mine, all mine. That's all you ever care about. So a grubber, money grubber, is someone who just wants money, okay? They're like taking, taking, taking. That's a lie. All right, said Mr. Z, calm down. But Maura was on her feet again. It's true. And poor widow Gwei can't stand it when somebody else has a good idea. Greg snorted and grabbed the eensy beensy book. Yeah, right. Like this is a good idea. You know what it is? Garbage. Cheap, stupid garbage. Just like you. And Greg ripped the front cover off the lost unicorn and threw it at Maura's face. Both of you, stop this. Just stop it. That's bad. Okay, top of 64. It was like Mr. Z had disappeared. All Mara could see was her little book as Greg began to tear off another page. Give me that. She swung her right arm to grab for it, and Greg yanked the book up above his head. Okay, it's going to get ugly, people. And as Mara's hand followed the moving book, the bottom three knuckles of his right hand connected with a sharp crack against the left side of Greg's nose. Greg's mouth dropped open. So did Mr. Z's and Mara's. There was a half second of stunned silence, and then, ow! Greg clutched his nose, which began to bleed, dripping onto Maura's desk. Room 27, usually quieter than the library, flashed to life. Did you see that? What? Where? Maura, she pounded him. No way. I saw it. Look at his nose. Ooh, blood. And amid all the other noise, Maura squeaked out, Oh, 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 I'm really sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to. Really, I didn't. So please notice all the beautiful dialogue on page 64, the quotation marks, the students talking back and forth. That's what I expect you to include in your um, narrative for me. Mr. Z wanted to take charge. He wanted to quiet the room, calm Laura, and get Greg to the nurse. But there was blood. Numbers never bleed, which Mr. Z believed was one of their best qualities, because just the word blood was enough to make him start looking for a chair so he could sit and put his head between his knees. Why is he going to do that? Yeah, he's going to pass out. Mr. Z turned away from Greg, already woozy, I love the word woozy, his face was going gray, but as he slumped into the nearest empty desk, swallowing hard, he managed to say, Maura, please help, Greg, to the nurse, I'll, I'll be here. Maura rushed to the front of the room, yanked five or six tissues from the box on Mr. Z's desk and hurried back to Greg. Here, Greg accepted the tissues, but when Maura took his elbow and began steering him toward the hallway, he jerked his arm free and made his own way out the door. He was bad enough he'd just gotten a bloody nose. It was bad enough he'd just gotten a bloody nose from a girl. No way was he going to let the same girl turn around and help him. Morris stopped at the doorway of the nurse's office, and Mrs. Emmett took charge. Sitting Greg on the back vinyl cot, she grabbed a plastic cold pack from the cabinet and smacked it on her desk three or four times to activate the crystals. 
She pulled in a pair on a pair of pale green gloves, took a paper towel, got it wet at the sink, and began to clean up Greg's face. Lean forward, the nurse took the cold pack and wrapped it in a deep, damp washcloth. Leaning over, she looked at the marks on Greg's skin, then pressed the cold pack gently against his face. Mrs. Emmett said, how'd this happen? It would have been so easy for Greg to lift his bloody hand, point a crimson finger, and shout, Maura did it. She slugged me right in the nose, hard. He could have yelled so loud that the principal across the hall would have heard him, but he didn't. He mumbled, it was an accident. Somebody grabbed for something, and I got in the way. The nurse lifted the coal pack and touched Greg's nose carefully with her gloved fingers. He flinched. So if you flinch, what do you do? Like that, right? Ms. Emmett said, hmm, it's not broken, but you're going to have a black eye, a real prize winner. You need to stay here till I'm sure the bleeding has stopped. She pressed the coal pack back in place and said, put your left hand here and press, not too hard. Greg did as she, he was told. Turning to the doorway, Mrs. Emmett said, Maura, did any blood get on you? Maura looked at her hands and down at her front. She shook her head. Anywhere else? asked the nurse. Where did it happen? In Mr. Z's room, some drops got on a desk, and maybe on the floor. Mrs. Emmett nodded. I'll send the custodian with disinfectant. You should get back to class now. Maura hesitated. It was nice Greg hadn't blamed her, and she wanted him to turn and look at her. She wanted to at least nod a thanks at him, but Greg kept his eyes shut, so Maura turned and left. Mrs. Emmett said, Greg, I have to find the custodian. You can lean back on those pillows now, but stay still, all right? And she was gone. The whole side of Greg's face throbbed as, turn to page 68, he eased himself back. Great, a black eye from a girl, just what I always wanted. What Maura had said in Mr. Z's room came back to him. You're a greedy little money grubber, just like always. Those words hurt. Worse than the nose. His big brothers have been calling him stingy and greedy for years. Is that what they think? That I'm a money grubber? Everybody wants a lot of money, right? What's wrong with that? Can I help it if I have good ideas and then I'm willing to work? There's nothing wrong with that. Gray became aware that he had something clutched in his right hand. He brought it up to where he could see it. It was a wad of bloody tissues and something else. Moore's mini book, The Lost Unicorn. The front cover was half gone, and some of the wrinkled pages were streaked with blood. Illustrated in living color, Greg thought, that made him smile, which forced a sharp pain through his nose and his left eye. He got the book in focus, and using only his right hand, he began to turn the pages. Greg could tell right away that it wasn't his kind of story, which had not come to surprise, come as a surprise. It was about a young unicorn who'd gotten lost, also not a surprise. At first, the unicorn was terrified, but then she remembered what her mother and father had told her. If you ever have a problem, find someone with a bigger problem and offer to help. I love that advice. Do this and your own worries will disappear. So the unicorn went looking for someone to help and found a princess who had been kidnapped, locked in a tower by a wicked ogre. The unicorn used her horn to chop down the tree which leaned against the tower and gave the princess a way to escape. Then the unicorn gave the princess a ride back to her mother's castle. The queen was so happy to have her daughter back that she asked ten of her best knights to help the unicorn find her way home, and they all lived happily ever after. Even though it seemed like a lame story to Greg, Greg had to admit that the writing was good and the artwork wasn't bad either. It was actually a tiny picture book, not at all like a comic book. Each of Moore's pictures took up a whole page. There was no sequenced panels, no page grids, and no speech balloons turning your page, like comics have. Still, the drawings were good, and Mora had drawn vines and flowers around the borders of each page. Bringing the little book closer to his good eye, Greg blinked. Then he rubbed his fingers on the page. The dark gray lines smudged and smeared. He could not believe what he was seeing. It is. This is the original artwork. Moore's drawing every book by hand and putting them together one at a time. No wonder she went nuts when I started ripping this one up. Because remember how he did an original and then copied it? Leaning his head back and closing both eyes, Greg smiled. He just made an important discovery. This meant that Moore did not know how to mass produce her books. It meant that she had probably made only four or five of them, tops. And it meant that at her current skill level as a mini book producer, she was just messing around. Hardly a serious competitor. Moore wasn't even in the minor leagues. And as business mind clicked away, Greg saw the future grow bright again. With kids buying so many of his chunky comics that he would make tons of money, he would have to start getting his comics printed professionally. He'd have to hire staff of artists to keep up with the increasing demand. Maybe rent a building or buy one. He started a website and started selling to the major comics distributors, too. Eventually, he'd have to open a branch office in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Hong Kong, and London, too. Chunky Comics International. He'd get so rich that he could have a different limo for every day of the week, each with a comic book hero painted on the hood. Brrm, Greg sat up straight, completely fuddled. I like that word fuddled, like discombobulated, right? 
He blinked. A cold pack lay on his arm. His head hurt. He was on the cot of the nurse's office. Then the events of the day tumbled back into his memory. He'd been sound asleep. Mrs. Emmett smiled at him from her desk. Feeling better? Yeah, a little. Greg leaned back again, reaching for his cold pack. But then he made himself sit up. Actually, I feel a lot better, so I guess I should get back to my next class. Greg had work to do. One more class period, and Thursday would be history. He had comics to sell. Turning your page to 72, Mora came to the doorway. Hi, I brought your backpack and your pencil case. Your face looks better. Greg didn't know what to say, so he just nodded. Mora said, you going to class? Greg looked at Mrs. Emmett. Can I? She nodded. You'll be fine, but if you feel uncomfortable, come back. All right? Okay. Greg stood up and walked to the door. Thanks. You're welcome. Mora gave Greg his things. He swung his backpack onto his shoulder, tucked the pencil case under his other arm, and headed down the long hallway toward the gym. Mora turned and walked beside him. So, she said, you've got the gym now. Nope. Greg picked up his pace. Mora matched him, step for step. Language arts? No. Art. Greg walked so fast that Mora almost had to trot to keep up. Hey, she said, before I forget, you have to go to Mr. Z's room after school. Still walking, Greg glanced at her. How come? He wants to talk to you, and me too, about what happened. Greg, great, said Greg. I'll be late for soccer, Mora said. Should you run around today? I meant with your eye and everything. Greg stopped short and swung to her face. Look, it's none of your business. It was just a little poke in the nose, all right? I'm okay, and I don't need you to tell me what to do. Fine, said Mora. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Good, because if I don't care, I don't care if you don't care. So go away. Don't worry, I'm going. Here. And Mora pushed a quarter into his hand. This is yours. What's this for? He asked. One of your comics. They're a quarter, right? What? You sold one? No, said Mora. I bought one. You? That's right. Mora stuck her chin out. Any law against that? No, said Greg. But why? That's a stupid question. I read it in math class. It's good. Greg, creative pride, won a small victory over ill temper. Greg smiled. You liked it? Really? Mora nodded. Yeah, it was okay, but the bell rang. Oops, I can't be late. Mora turned and dashed for class. But what? Greg called after her. Later, she called back, and Greg thought, later? Oh, yeah, because we have to go to see Mr. Z. The art room was close, and Greg quickly forgot Mora's comments about his comic book. He had to finish a wire sculpture. The thing was due Monday, and it was going to take a small miracle to get it done on time. Still, that didn't keep Greg from selling three more copies of Return of the Hunter before the end of art class. Excellent. Now we're on 75. We'll see if we can do Chapter 8 also. It's called Chew Down. When Greg got to Mr. Z's room after school on Thursday, no one else was there. He sat at the desk in the front row and looked over at the clock. It was already 3.05. Greg thought, six minutes. If he's not here in six minutes, I'm going to soccer. A minute later, Mora burst into the room. Sorry, I know I'm late, but... Then she saw only Greg was there. She stopped and then walked to the front of the room. I thought I was late. You are late, said Greg. He jerked a thumb toward Mr. Z's desk. Just not as late as he is. Mora sat down a few seats away and turned to look out the windows. A minute went by. The empty school felt too quiet to Greg. He said, hmm, so what's he want to say to us anyway? Without turning her head, Mora said, three guesses. All right, said Greg. Then he remembered what Mora had said about his comic book. It was okay, but Greg wanted Mora to finish that sentence. Then he thought, what do I care what she thinks? But after another minute of silence, his curiosity won out. Still, he didn't want Mora to think he actually cared what she thought. Then he hit, then he hit on a way to bring up the subject. Greg said, I read your unicorn book. It was good, for what it is. Mora turned to face him, arching one of her pale eyebrows. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing, said Greg. It's not really my kind of story, that's all. You know, princesses and unicorns. I like comic books. And your book isn't a comic. So why'd you read it? Greg shrugged. It was the only reading material I had in the nurse's office. I was bored. How come you read my story? Mora tossed her head. Same reason. But there wasn't anything better to do in math. But you bought a copy of mine and said it was good, right? Yeah, Mora admitted. But that's what Greg had been waiting for. But... What? What didn't you like about it? Mora was quiet a moment, and when she spoke, Greg saw she was choosing her words carefully. Well, it's sort of like what you said about my book, about it not being your kind of story. See, I know you want to try to sell a lot of copies, Greg interrupted, because you think I'm a greedy little money grubber, right? Mora's eyes flashed. 
Can you just listen? Greg nodded, and Maura continued. I liked the story, and I liked the artwork, too, but I don't think many other girls would. And since half the kids at school are girls, if you write boy stories, you're only going to sell half as many books as you could. Greg pretended to look shocked and then shook a finger at Maura. Boy stories? I'm going to tell Mrs. Sanborn you said that. Mrs. Sanborn was her social studies teacher, and she talked a lot about equal rights for women and girls, top of page 78. She got furious whenever someone suggested that men and women or boys and girls should be treated differently. Maura said, don't be dumb. I'm not talking about equal rights. I'm talking about what girls like and boys. And no matter what, Mrs. Sanborn says, most boys don't pick stories about princesses. And most girls don't pick stories about cavemen with spears. Most, not all. Some of you like both of those. And that's great. As Maura finished the sentence, Mr. Z walked in. Cavemen with spears. Are you two calling each other names? Maura and Greg shook their heads and Mr. Z said, good. I was delayed in the office. I was afraid I'd get here and find you two wrestling on the floor, throwing chairs at each other. But you're not name-calling and you're not fighting? Looks like progress. He pulled a front row desk forward a few feet, turned it around, and sat down midway between them. Mr. Z had been planning on what he would say to Greg and Moore all afternoon. He already knew exactly where he wanted the meeting to end up, but he was prepared to take this time getting here. In his mind, it was like a math problem. He would add right ideas, subtract wrong ones, divide fuzzy thinking by pure logic, and then he and the children would nod and smile at each other as peace and understanding multiplied itself. Looking first into Moore's face and then into Greg's, Mr. Z said, Now tell me precisely what started this mess during sixth period. Greg, you first. Greg took a deep breath and then let it out slowly. Well, it really started at the end of lunch period. That's when I found out Moore was selling little books like mine, ripping me off. I did not rip you off. Maura, Mr. Z raised a warning finger. Quiet, your turn's coming. Maura nodded but kept on talking. He just said a minute ago that my story is nothing like his. Yeah, said Greg, his voice rising. But it's still a mini book, right? Admit it, you ripped me off. Quiet, both of you. Mr. Z was not used to raising his voice. I'm not going to put up with this. If you two can't talk this out, with me, then I'll turn the whole matter over to Mrs. Davenport and your parents. He looked from Maura to Greg and then back again. Is that clear? Now I asked Greg to speak first. Maura, not another word. Turning to Greg, he said, so you found out Maura had these booklets for sale and you got mad? Anything else? Well, said Greg, just that it didn't seem fair. It was my idea. So yeah, I got mad and I came to class that way and you saw the rest and that's all. Mr. Z nodded and said to Greg, okay, now it's your turn to listen, not one word. Turning to Maura, he said, let's hear your side. Maura shrugged. There's not much to tell. I mean, where, what did I do? I was sitting here in class, and he comes blasting in and starts shouting and throwing stuff in my face. And me hitting him? That was an accident. He said so himself, to the nurse. So I didn't do anything. Pfft. Greg pushed a puff of air between his lips. Not a word, but close enough to draw a glare from the math teacher. Mr. Z turned back to Maura. Show me your little book. Do you have one? Maura zipped open the pocket on the front of her backpack, pulled out a copy of The Lost Unicorn, and handed it to Mr. Z. He quickly turned the pages, scanning the text and looking at the pictures. Then, turning to Greg, he asked, And how about yours? Greg took a copy from his pencil case and handed it over. Again, Mr. Z did a skim. Looking up from Crayon's face to Greg's, he said, So even though these are clearly very different themes, you're still mad that Maura did something similar, right? Use the same idea? Greg nodded. Right, my idea. Looking Greg in the eye, Mr. Z said, so you agree with me that a little book with pictures is an idea? Yeah, Greg said, of course. Like I said, it was my idea. Mr. Z shook his head. That's not what I said. I said the little book with the pictures is an idea, not that it was, is your idea. Then holding up both mini books between his thumb and index finger, he said, these two different things are still just one idea, right? Greg nodded, right, and the idea was mine first. Mr. Z leaned forward, but the thing about a true idea is that no one can really own it, even the person who uses it first. In mathematics, the Sumerians were the first to use the idea of place value, over 5,000 years ago, but they did not own the idea. And when you sit here in my room, adding large numbers, and you carry tens or hundreds over to the next place column, does a Sumerian come running in the room and say, hey, quit it, that's my idea? Greg didn't answer. He lowered his eyes and stared at a smear of green gum on the floor. Mr. Z went on. Now, if Maura had used your character, this Creon guy, or if she had made her drawings look just like yours, then I think you'd have more reason to be upset. But she didn't do that. She used an old idea, a small book, in her own way. 
And yes, she might have seen you do it first, but that's the way ideas work. They spread. So I don't think you should be mad at more. If anything, you should feel flattered. Someone thought the way you used an old idea was so new and interesting that she wanted to try it out for herself. Mr. Z paused. Greg was looking down at his feet, studying his sneakers. He decided to just let Mr. Frizzyhead talk himself out. Why argue? The sooner this guy finished yakking, the sooner he could leave for soccer practice. Look at me, Greg. Greg tipped his head back. He flicked his eyes to the teacher's face and then back to the floor. The math teacher said, Is any of this making sense to you? Greg shrugged. Sure, I guess so. Then I think all this adds up to one thing. Mr. Z paused, waiting for Greg to look at him in the face. It didn't happen. So he said, Greg, you need to apologize tomorrow. Greg's head jerked up. Apologize? Me? No. No way. Maura knew how stubborn Greg was, and she liked the talk that they'd been having before the teacher had arrived. She quickly said, It's okay, Mr. Z. He doesn't have to apologize. Mr. Z said, Yes, he does. First, he has to apologize to you. Then he has to apologize to me for making a huge disturbance in my top of page 84 room and wasting precious class time and all because of a comic book greg felt the fury rising in his chest he wanted to tip his head back and howl like a crayon figurative language again language again howl like a crayon simile he wanted to get up close to the man's huge nose and shout i'm the guy with the black eye here i'm the one who's had the idea ripped off apologize